Life is a series of unscripted experiences that forge us into unique individuals. These are the experiences and stories of those who possess the will, beliefs, and fortitude required to overcome obstacles, pursue their passions, and achieve success. Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. Steve Lemmy joins us tonight. Steve, everyone knows you. Um, I would say you burst on the scene, obviously, from Super Troopers playing Mac. But first, let me just welcome you to the show, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm psyched to be here. No problem. I, um, I mean, you don't have to sit here and go through your whole background, your history. I mean, everyone that everyone knows Super Troopers is like a, a cult classic that hit hit uh hit it big after i guess it was in the theaters and all we'll get into that later i want to i want to come back to it but what's your guys's whole um you're one of the founding members of what broken lizard comedy troupe or comedy club whatever you guys call it yeah comedy group is uh, is what we call it oh man the kid it's already started it's already started that's all right Everyone, everyone can relate, man. And people, everyone has kids. They understand. I got kids, but I'm lucky to have a basement here in Ohio. You're in California, so you probably don't have a basement, do you? I don't have a basement. I don't have a basement. I have, uh, I have a, a kid who uh, has lost his mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's four o'clock or it's four thirty here in the afternoon. So he's like, he's uh, he's in that cranky time. Yeah, man. Don't worry. If you need to, if you need to take a break, we can always stop it chop it up and put it all together my buddy todd will put it together for you but don't worry about it if you need to go be a dad at some point we can always stop no we're good we're good um yeah yeah in a comedy group uh like we we always like comedy troupe we would get sad about that because uh (laughs) he's going potty good Uh, because like people in a group get groupies if you're in a troupe you get troopies and that's not that cool so like you know (laughs) we're like comedy group is is uh is good uh, we formed a college and, uh, did you guys all go to school together? Yeah, we did. Wow. Where yeah. was that? Colgate university in uh, central New York. It's, uh, uh, let's see. It's like, uh, it's probably an hour away from Syracuse. Okay. Yeah. I, is it like, um, so I've had, uh, Sal on from impractical jokers. I don't know if you know those guys at all. And they have, um, what's their group called now? I just blanked on it. Do you know? It's, uh, uh Let's see. The Tenderloins. Yeah. They're the Tenderloins. So is it like, how do you officially start a group? You guys open up like an LLC or what do you do? Or you just say, you start calling yourselves that? No, you know, we were like, uh, we just, I actually wanted to audition for a play in college. And uh, I was was actually at a football game uh, tailgating and uh, I was a little fucked up. And my girlfriend at the time was like, hey, you know, you're always saying you want to audition for a play. Why don't you, uh, there's a bunch that are, you know, holding tryouts right now. And so I went in and, and, uh, two of the guys who are in the group now, uh, Jay, who's the Indian guy and Kevin, who's the, who's the big guy. He plays Farva. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, uh, they were having auditions for a comedy group. So I tried out and I got in and, uh, we just started messing around. Like we just started writing sketches and things like that. And like, uh, you know, the first, Hey dude, come here, come here. Come on camera, buddy. C- come here. Everyone wants to see who's doing the tantrum. Carlos, come here. He wants chicken. Can you hear that? Chicken. I just fed my kids chicken nuggets. That's great. <laughs> I'm three hours ahead of you, so I was, yeah, I was closer to bedtime. Uh, um, but so, yeah, so we started doing sketches, and then, like, uh, the first show, like, we got, like, 30 people who came, and then the next show was, like, 100 people, and then by the fourth night of the show at, at the school, we were turning people away, and so we kind of realized that we had a good thing going, and, um, you know, we, we moved the group to the city after college, and uh, that was, like, uh, you know, we started performing, we literally, we were performing in a gay, a gay cabaret club. And uh, which was like a two drink minimum place in the village. They were the only place that would take us and uh, like a bunch of dudes performing together. And so they gave us like three Wednesdays. And then uh, the first show, like all of our like 21 year old friends came and sold the place out of beer. Like at the end of the show, like every table was covered with empty beer bottles. And they were like, okay, we'll have you back uh, for the rest of the summer. 
like they extended us for three months and then after the second show they gave us two nights a week like Wednesdays and Saturdays and then after the third show they gave us a two-year contract and so we were just kind of off to the races and uh, it, was, it was all because of the commerce of, uh, of beer drinking and uh, was that all five of you at the time actually I think there were like uh, there were nine of us at the time Ooh. it was uh, there were like six guys and three girls and uh, you know that was the beginning of Broken Lizard, because uh, before in college we were we had a different name. We were Charred Goosebeak in, in college. This is the kind of dumb shit. Like you, you get to play football. That's that's tough. I was in a comedy group. You have to come up with like dumbass names for your for your groups. So that's Charred Goosebeak. Well, you guys are like ahead of your time, though. I think because um, you, I mean, what the uh, Super Troopers was what two thousand one when it came out. Yeah. So I feel like you guys were a little bit ahead of your time because now with the internet and with everything going on, I feel like every kid in the world, you know, is going to have a YouTube channel and they probably have groups with weird names they put together. And their dream is to have a write a movie that that makes it like you guys have and have done multiple movies now. But what you said, what was crazy, I I heard you say you said so you had to you had to try out or audition to get into the group. Yeah. Well, the first the. That first group was uh, Jay and Kevin just decided they were going to start one. They wanted to start a comedy group. And so, but the school made them hold auditions just so that it wasn't like an exclusive club or anything like that. It was very PC. And so I knew those guys. We were actually in the same fraternity. And, uh, but so, you know, I still had to go audition. And there were a lot of other people from the school auditioning. So I did, I had to win the part. And so, yeah, that is, that's, cool that you actually usually or most of the time you hear the guys were like four or five best friends and they just all of a sudden it happened and you guys happened to to audition I'm sure they they had a bit of a bias obviously watching you they knew they were going to pick you up most likely and how many guys like what's the total membership now of Broken Lizard is it just you five or does it go span across all the guys you have in in all the movies yeah it's the five of us and um, you know we have a bunch of people that we use regularly in our movies now um, but there's five of us who write and produce the movies and, uh, and Jay and Kevin have directed the movies. And, uh, so, you know, it's, people have tried to, uh, I wouldn't say infiltrate or join, but like we've worked with, with outsiders before and they always, I mean, you know what it's like, like when somebody's the new guy who comes along, they just feel naturally intimidated by the, the bond that you guys already have and inside jokes and, uh, you know, the shorthand. So, like, you know, I mean, that, I think a lot of people dropped out. Like, origi originally we were 14 people in college. And then it was nine people in New York City. And, and people just started dropping out because they couldn't take the, the main five of us. Like, we annoyed the shit out of them because we would do, like, mom jokes and, like, just say stupid shit. And, like, we had one guy who quit and he wrote a letter and said that we, you know, we gave him a headache. Uh, and, uh, like, he couldn't stand us anymore. And who do you write the letter to? He wrote the letter to all of us. Oh, okay. I he thought said, he was going to write to like the head of the school or something. No, no, no. He said, "Dear Broken Lizard, um, <laughs> I'm quitting the group. Uh, performing with you guys gives me a headache. I can't stand listening to your mom jokes uh, for one more minute, and you know, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So, you know, he left. Well, it's like, it's like Pete Best leaving the Beatles, isn't it? I suppose. Was it Pete so. Best was he the drummer that Ringo took over for? He was. Well, I know, I think he was a fifth musician. Yeah. He was a fifth guy that they didn't think fit the image, right? Yeah, so they booted him, is that right? I don't know if they booted him or if, like, the, I know with the, like, the Stones had that guy, Ian Stewart, who, like, the management was like, ah, he doesn't fit with the image of the group, so he became the road manager um, and would just sit there, you know, on the sidelines while they, while they rocked out, but... Uh, Pete Best, I don't know what his deal was. I don't know if he quit or if they kicked him out or. Yeah, I just always, I, I've always heard his name thrown around when you talk about like a guy leaving a group and then the group all of a sudden becomes the Beatles and. It's tough. You know, they're all basically should be billionaires and this guy's hanging out playing, playing the jazz club, you know, on High Street over to High State's campus or something and telling yeah. people war stories about playing with the Beatles back in Germany when they were first starting or something. Dude, so, that's, tough. that's tough. <laughs> that would be tough to have. To, it would be hard to feel good for your buddies there, I'm sure. You know how people, if they like break up with a girl or someone dumps them, they're like, well, I just want her to be happy. 
And yeah. you're like, no, they don't. No one wants her to be happy. That's for sure. Yeah, you want her to be miserable. <laughs> well, especially if they, they actually liked her. If you really did have feelings for her, you, you don't want her. You don't want her happy. No, no chance. And no. if you hate her, you definitely don't want her happy. So either way, you're screwed. Yeah, exactly. Now, so everybody, um, I see it, what you guys, you and and Kevin Hef, Heffernan Farba, go around. Yeah. You guys do stand up together. I, I see you guys touring all the time. Yeah, yeah, we toured for about three years. We have a, a special out on Netflix uh, called Fat Man, Little Boy, and we actually just uh, finished shooting another special that we shot in Denver. Um, but we performed at the Columbus Funny Bone yes, um, yes. A, a couple of years ago, and that was that was a fun town, um, a fun weekend. Are you guys yes. both on stage together the whole time, or do you like go one and one, and then you join up for the last whatever? No, well, we come out together, and then uh, usually he stays on, and does like thirty minutes, and then I'll come back out, and we'll, we'll tell like a two-man story together, and then uh, he'll leave, and I'll I'll stay out for the final thirty minutes. And do you have a stand-up background, or did you just start doing that when you guys, you know, created Broken Lizard? No, I, I didn't have a stand-up background. I mean, when I was, uh, you know, when we started doing sketch comedy. That was the first time any of us had really performed live on stage, and then. Uh, we got into the films, and then there was a writer's strike in Hollywood uh, probably like four or five years ago, and, and uh, Broken Lizard, we decided we, we wanted to uh, do a, a sketch show again, but like take it around the country. And so since now, we, you know, we knew we had fans. And, you know, like when you do sketch comedy, you have to schlep around your, uni you know, these costumes, you know, and like for us, it's like we five cop costumes, five beer fest costumes, and then like... We have like a gorilla suit and a mermaid outfit, and it's just such a pain in the ass that you're like, it became so much easier to do stand up. You didn't have to bring anything. You'd do a mic, and you know, it was terrifying the first time I tried it for sure, and I definitely sucked. But uh, you know, after like anything, it's like if you're doing it, uh, you know, four or five days a week, after three or four years, you do start to get okay. So. Have you, did you, did you have any stand-ups like take you under their wing? Cause I know that's like a weird, um, those guys are real like protective of stand-up. All the diehard guys think that they don't want some Hollywood hotshot coming in and thinking that he can take their gigs. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> because it's funny because like we don't, like we didn't have to do, deal with the hard knocks that they had to deal with because like they, a lot of, like, a lot of the guys who've made it like Louis CK and Bill Burr and Jim Gaffigan, you're, you're, you're seeing them now after they've been at it for 20 years. And that's how long, I mean, you know, it takes anywhere from like, you know, maybe 10 years for somebody to even be noticed. And uh, so, you know, in that time, they like, they get used to like dealing with hecklers. You know, they have like a million comebacks for hecklers. And, you know, if they're bombing on stage, they know how to deal with that. And you're just starting, like, now us, okay, so like, because we have fans from the movies, we're, you know, we can headline clubs and uh, and sell out theaters, but then you know it's basically like you're a rookie playing, you know, in the big leagues for the first time, and and like you suck, and comedians are there and they're like you motherfucker, <laughs> you don't even know, you don't even know, you you haven't, you haven't paid the dues, so like, I think um, uh, we definitely felt like outsiders, but at this at this point now we've you know we've got a few guys who we're friends with like Jim Gaffigan who's in Super Troopers. And, uh, you know, a, a bunch, a few other comedians who've been pretty cool to us. I, I would imagine that, yeah, they, it seems like it's a, a weird deal where they think like a guy will come in and take their time, take their stage time or just think he can walk in. Cause like you said, I've heard comics say like it's, it's 10 years of grinding on the road before you really become, you know, solid at, at, at being a comic. And there's no guarantee then I know it's a ton of work, but, uh, I'm just picturing like a guy like Mark Marin seeing you guys go up and thinking how like upset and distraught because those guys always a lot of them seem uh pretty jealous they're, they're openly jealous about things but the thing about that is guys that are famous i've i've heard them people say it gives you like three to five minutes of the crowd being on your side and then after that it's up to you to be funny so you oh. guys have had to prove that you got to be funny though after you get those first three minutes of freedom basically i would say even three three minutes of freedom is is generous because like i've come out there with crowds that are like chanting my name <laughs> and like I tell one shitty joke and it's over really? and yeah it's over because then what happens is like you start to get 
you know you've bombed, and you, like the first one, and you're standing there in front of all these people, and uh, you start to sweat, and then you can feel yourself sweating, and then you're like, you can hear your lips smacking against each other, like, and uh, and there's a lot of quiet out there, and you're like, this sucks, and then you know there's people who who haven't seen you before. Oh, look at this, that's my wife. Oh, hello. Hello. How you that's doing? You. Hi, AJ. Hi, how are you? Good. What's good? Not much. T thanks for letting your husband come on here. I know it's tough. I have two kids myself. But you're uh, you're man enough yourself. What he wants to do. That's right, AJ. I'm, he, I'm, he tells me what to do. I'm the man of the house. I, I, I believe it. Big okay. big Hollywood. It's like living with Daniel Day-Lewis, basically. That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> right. I drink your milkshake. Yeah. <laughs> he's always, for some reason, that's always the actor I, I mentioned when I think about any actor is Daniel Day-Lewis just because he's so weird and he's a... Uh, What's it called? Is it not a what is it? A method actor. That's what he is, right? He's a method actor. Are you guys method actors on the set of Super Troopers? No, we're the worst. Like, <laughs> I was just giving a Heffern a hard time about it yesterday. Like, there's a scene in we made a movie called Club Dread. Oh yeah, I've seen it. And he's supposed to be like a like a master masseuse and like an expert with swords. And like we were like, are you, are you gonna do some sword training? You know, to become good at it. And he's like. No, I'll just on the day it'll be fine. They don't care. They, don't care. <laughs> they do not. They don't. You don't. They don't care. It's great. We see. It's like us seeing behind the curtain of of a of a big Hollywood actor because it's we don't we don't get to see like what it's like for people to be a dad and you're you're showing it, man. It's real life. I like it. Oh yeah. Well, it's like. Uh, I mean, you know what it's like. It's it's. Uh, here's where we're fortunate. Aside from getting to to do, do what we love doing. We do get to hang out with our kids uh, more than most dads who who have to work real jobs. You know, well, you Not just have a, you have a, we a weird schedule. I'm sure where sometimes you're you're home a lot, and then if you're shooting, you're probably gone for little ex extended periods of time. Yeah, I mean, you know, like we're we're shooting Super Troopers two this year. Have uh, you guys started filming? No, September twenty eighth. Okay, and I know you guys have a huge. Can you explain how that came about? I know you have a big Indiegogo campaign and. I think you, it was said uh, if you guys raise two million, you could start the movie, shoot like a bare bones project, and then you guys are up to last I've checked is like four point five or more right now. How did that whole? Um, if the first one came out in two thousand one, have you guys been actively trying or writing this Super Troopers two? Yeah, so like, uh, you know, we made Club Dread after Super Troopers, then we made Beer Fest. Did you write all those? Like, when did those? When did you guys write all those movies? We started. We actually we made our first movie in '96. That was a movie called Puddle Cruiser, and then uh, we started writing Super Troopers right after that. And in fact, a couple of people made offers to to buy the Super Troopers script in like 1997. And uh, they don't. They don't care. I love you too. <laughs> they don't. Uh, so yeah, it took us about four years to get the money for Super Troopers, and uh, ultimately we, we got it from a private investor. It was a, a million and a quarter, and we shot the movie independently, and then we uh, and then we sold it at the, the Sundance Film Festival. By the way, can you hear that noise in the background? Yeah, a, a decent amount. You can hear it. Oh really? Let, it, let me move. Let me move. <laughs> But no, no, there's too much noise. <laughs> all right. It's all right. You get a little tour of the part of your house. It looks good, man. Yeah, you got like an outdoor, it looks like, like an outdoor hallway almost or all glass. Yeah, well, that's the the left side of the house here. Is, is, oh, it's yeah. like a glass hallway. Oh, the, pool, the kids I, love. I love it. Yeah, and then here's my gigantic Italian uh, Club Dread post. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. La Canza di Sangue. What's the guy's? What's his name again? That plays um, Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton. That's right. Yeah, he's awesome. Oh man, he was great in that. Did you guys have a relationship before that movie with him, or did you just get him for that? No, we got him for that. I mean, he. Uh, you know, I, I can't remember. I don't know what the workings were for him and his uh, his agent, but um, what what happened was, you know, we had we'd just done Super Troopers, and we were we were pretty hot there because uh, Super Troopers had done well. Relative to what it was, it did well at the box office, and it was doing well on, on DVD. And so, uh, you know, we had the script that we sent out, and uh, Paxton's agent found it and was like, "You got to do this. These guys are, you know, they're up and coming." And so uh, he showed up, 
And uh, I mean, we had a great time. We were in Mexico with him for ten weeks, and uh, you know, honestly, it's the best. It's the best. Uh, one of the best experiences I've ever had being down there. And, and he was uh, he was ri- ridiculous. Now, when um, when Super Troopers, well, you said you sold it at Sundance. Like, how does that whole process work? So you get into Sundance. I know just to get do that is a big step to get your film in, and then. Who ended up buying it, and how does that whole process go down? So, you, you know, what happens is you have to submit your film uh, to, the, to the festival, and we did it twice. We, our first movie, Puddle Cruiser, we submitted, and we actually sent them a rough cut. And, on, and this is 96, so this is on VHS tape. And basically there's, I don't even know how many people they've got, but like they're getting, you know, tens of thousands of submissions. And of all quality, you know, like pe- people are sending in low quality stuff, high quality stuff. Ours was actually pretty high quality, but, um, and then you wait for a while. And then in the case of our first movie, Puddle Cruiser, we got rejected. And so, you know, we finished Puddle Cruiser. We had sent them this rough cut. The next year we got accepted again. And then you go and the festivals, you know, whatever it is, 10 days, two weeks long. And there's all these movies playing and some are in the competition. And then there's like, uh, you know, there's, I mean, different categories. There's, there's documentaries, there's short films, there's animation. But, like, right off the bat, you start, all these studios are there, and they're buying, they're making offers on movies. And so, you know, when we didn't sell our, our, our first movie there, we were pretty devastated because it was, you know, that's, that's the place it's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen there, you're kind of screwed. And so... When we got in, so with Super Troopers, we, you know, because we had been there once before, we had a, a better shot. And so uh, we went and we sold it. We, we played, they put us in the midnight screening series. And so we, can you see me, by the way? Because we're pixelating again. I got you. Yeah, I can see you. Your, your connection might be a little different in your office, but see, I'm all right here. I'm going back. I'm going back to the danger zone. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we got into, we got into Sundance, and, and it was easier. Like, they gave us an extension to submit because we had been there once before, and so we had a track record. And then they told us earlier than most people that we had gotten in, so that was, that was a big deal. You know, we were pretty scared about that. And then uh, the first night of the festival, we played uh, the midnight screening, and it was the first time we had uh, any of us had seen Super Troopers in front of a crowd, and uh, played great. And the next day, uh, we sold uh, Fox Searchlight Studio made an offer for the movie, a pretty generous offer. And uh, you know, it's the kind of thing where they're like, they they made the offer and they said uh, we had to accept it before the next screening of our movie. So the negotiations were fast and furious and, uh, and we closed the deal. But, uh, so we were the first movie to sell at that, at that year's festival. So it was kind of crazy because we went from having a movie there that didn't sell to then being the first film to sell the next time around. And it's like, you know, I, I don't know about, about you, but that's one of those times when like, uh, like maybe when you got drafted for the NFL, like where like when you're behind closed doors, you, you have yourself a little ma- a manly cry. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh my god, there it is, finally. <laughs> well, I don't have to. But I've I've said before, I'm I don't have to be behind closed doors. Ever since I had kids, man, I'd cry at like commercials and crazy <laughs> stuff. That Robert, I always use the one movie with Robert De Niro. I don't even know what it's called. I think the kids are all right. That's what it is. I don't know if yeah. you've, have you ever seen that. The kids are all right. Yeah. Uh, Probably I mean, not. No. I just happened to see that in the theater with my wife and oh my god it's not even like supposed to be a sad movie but for some reason it was to me it's something about kids and different oh it's crazy man so yeah i'm not i'm not scared to to cry in public it happens all the time the more kids i have the worse it gets so i don't even i don't even hide it anymore but that had to be awesome so if you so fox searchlight buys it so that means that for you guys the film you know it's going to go to theaters and they they're going to pay all this money to market it and distribute it yeah, and they, you know, you negotiate that in advance. Um, so we knew that they were going to put it at least out in a certain number of cities, on a certain number of screens, and uh, we didn't know how much they were going to spend to market it. But they were they were spending a pretty good amount of money on the, you know, to, I mean, they paid I, I think they paid three and a half million dollars to to buy the movie, and so 
Um, you know, we knew it was probably going to be maybe at least a $10 million marketing push. Um, but you know, it's like in our business, you, you're, you get so jaded pretty quickly that like you, you don't, you don't believe it until you see it in the theater. And, uh, you know, I think a, a few months before the movie came out, we started seeing the commercials running, uh, in the, you know, like you'd be at a bar and you'd see it on the TV with no sound or wherever you were, like, you know, they were just playing like crazy. And, uh, so, you know. It was cool, and the movie came out, and, and it did, you know, relatively well for what it was. But, but then it wasn't until like a year later, after it had come out on DVD, that like all of a sudden, you were walking down the street, and like people would come running out of bars and be like, "Hey, you're in that movie!" And then you know, it just started to grow and grow. And you know, I mean, honestly, it's like we couldn't have predicted that; it just happened. And then you guys were the. I'm sure everyone still gives you still quotes lines from that all the time to you uh i'm sure that probably gets old at some point but uh yeah i'm just always curious on how that whole process works of because people like me that aren't involved in anything out there in hollywood and don't know what's happening like just to to know that you get into sundance and then someone buys it so when they buy it like when you negotiate are you guys like directly negotiating or you guys have an agent that runs all that for you yeah you have uh you have a sales a sales representative who, uh, you know, is probably in our case, it's a guy named John Sloss. He's a lawyer and, uh, and a film producer himself. And so, uh, you know, but we were sitting there in the room. Oh, okay. So you don't have like individual agents for each of you, do you? We do now. We do now. At the beginning, you know, we were all signed by, uh, by a big agency. And then, uh, you know, it's like, it's tough because then they're just sending the five of you out for the same things, and it's like uh, it just becomes weird. And so slowly over the years, we have uh, separated to each having our own representation. But uh, but but in this case, it's you have you have one agent representing the film, basically. Okay, yeah, that's why. Like I was thinking, the so the film and that guy goes back and forth, and then do they have to work out like I don't like back end points and all that stuff? Is that what that's what happens like in that that? Fast and Furious negotiations you guys had at Sundance? Everything. Yeah, it's happening. It's happening in a matter of hours. And, and do they want all of they want all the back end points basically at the studio? Yeah. <laughs> so what's so this next one, okay, let's say Super Troopers 2 now. If you guys do this Indiegogo campaign, is that backed by a studio or do you want to get it backed by a studio? Like what's the ultimate goal there? Well, this one is kind of like a, a, a specific thing because we would have liked for Fox to just pay for the movie and, and, and do it traditionally like we did with Club Dread and like we did with Beer Fest where, you know, like, like most movies you get, or like most studio movies, you get a budget and, you know, they, you, they do it. Uh, in this case, for whatever reason, uh, Searchlight, Fox did not want to do it, but they said they would distribute the movie. So that means, so this is, this is a really specific thing, but it, it means that they are, they will put the movie out on a, a, a large number of screens and a lot of theaters and they're going to take a, a percentage, a small fee. And what we have to do is uh, raise the money to shoot it and then we also have to raise the money to market the movie. So the two million dollars that we were talking about, that is the minimum that we could just shoot the movie for. And, you know, and that would mean like, you know, we're shooting it in like three weeks, six days a week and, you know, 16 hour days or something. Um, you know, so the four and a half million dollars that we raised actually, uh, you know, the, the, the economics of these crowdfunding things is that you actually only get about half of that because you have to pay fees, you have to pay a campaign director, you have to pay for all the merchandise that you're giving away and you have to pay like to ship it and, you know, all that stuff. So it's like it's more expensive than people think. Well, you guys have to pay for your I was looking through the page um, and people can still donate, right? Yeah, they can. Um I was looking through it, man. You guys are going to pay with a lot of your time, too. Your next couple of years might be locked up trying to fulfill some of those, uh, what you guys are offering. Hey, AJ, I got to yeah. take get to the potty. Go do it. You got it, man. Hey, I'll, uh, here, I'll just call you right back. Just call me, call me back when he's done. I'll call you back. All right. I really, I'm sorry about this. You're all right. Yeah, here. Here, why don't say hi to my friend? Can you say? Hey, bud. Your name Carlos? Can, Carlos, can you say hi, AJ? Hi, AJ. Hey, buddy. I have a four-year-old, too. How? When's your birthday? Do you know when your birthday is? A cake. Cake? 
<laughs> yeah, cake is, is true. Everybody loves cake. Yeah, he's uh, September 12th. All right, yeah, my, my daughter's uh, December 4th. So I have, a, I have a little girl that would love you, buddy. She loves guys already. You can tell early. Can you say bye? You want to say bye? Bye. Bye, buddy. See ya. All right, bye, bye. <laughs> later. All right, try not to yell, okay? <laughs> Whisper. All right. <laughs> oh, you're good, man. Um, yeah, okay. I don't. I don't know where I was. What are you? We were talking about the the crowdfunding the Indiegogo deal. Oh um, yeah. I, oh. I was just thinking. I know you said you have all these fees and all this stuff. Do you? Uh, I was looking at your your guys' site. One of the offers, and I don't think anyone's taken it up yet, is I think for twenty or fifty thousand dollars, you guys will come be the best man in someone's wedding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we yeah we offered that, and like the first day, we had three people who were like you know sniffing around and asking us for the date, and uh, nobody took us up on it. I was surprised about that one. It's not over, man. You might you might that might happen. I mean. I guess I'm, I'm trying to think the kind of girl you'd have to marry to be like, okay, hey, here's my who, you got your groomsmen like, yep, got five guys all lined up. Like, yeah. <laughs> the girl was either maybe a guy actually did was planning on buying that, and then he told his fiance who his groomsmen were, and she was like, do you have any real friends or what? You just pay you pay all this money to bring these friends to you. So yeah, I don't know, man. That's a it's a it's a It'll be a tough to find a guy that A has cash to do that and B either doesn't have friends or doesn't care about his friends and yeah. you in. Yeah, no, I mean you're right. You, you raised some good points. And the wife would have to be also like extremely uh, cool and patient and uh Or understand. on the flip side, she's just a diehard Super Troopers fan and, and Broken Lizard and Club Dread and seen everything. And then you might even be a little, he might get a little worried that she's going to try to make a pass at, at all you guys. She's going to go for every one of you guys at the, at the wedding. And he's probably like, ah, nah, I can't do it, man. Sure. Sure. That's yeah. a real, that's a real scenario with, with you guys too. You guys are all charismatic. I'm sure she'll, I'm, I'm sure you guys are all married anyway. I know you are, but I'm sure it wouldn't stop her. If a girl was that, that involved in what dude pay 20 grand to have you come to the wedding. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of uh, a lot of strange things have happened out there. A lot of strange things. You go out in L.A., man. You never know where you are. It's a it's a weird world. But you know, AJ, I, I appreciate you saying that. But let's let's face it. Even where you are, there's some weird shit going on. <laughs> everywhere, everywhere there is. You, you're right about that, man. Yeah. Everywhere you look, I um, I'm looking out. Have you seen this stuff recently on guys, uh, athletes? basically blowing their hands up, lighting off fireworks. I don't know if you've seen any of this lately. Yeah, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a Giants fan. And, uh, oh, goodness. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, listen, we've had our share. And I don't have to – I mean, you're, you're playing for the Bengals now, so I don't have to tell you about that. We've had our share of uh, guys who've had their brushes with the law. And, uh, you know, be it Plexico Burris uh, shooting himself in the, in the leg – so now you know JPP with his uh, with his hand, uh, you know. I mean, that's not obviously he didn't do anything illegal, but uh, he did something stupid. But, yeah, that, I think now I see why my dad, when I was younger, he would always keep worried about us lighting fireworks off, and we have mortars. I mean, even when I'm older, we've had you know lighting off real fireworks, mortars, and it seems like every time the tubes tip over and start shooting back at the house and back at all of us, and there's always a moment when you got to run and dive and get underneath your car or something. Yeah, but then, like later on that night when you're having beers with your buddies, that's the thing you talk about the the most is yeah. like how you know Schmolke almost uh, stuck a bottle rocket up his ass and you know it got stuck. <laughs> and then, the, but then usually at that point you're like, all right, we're gonna go light this grand finale that we got waiting for us in the garage. Oh yeah, and that's when the bad stuff happens. So I'm good. I got on my limbs right now. That's why I'm. Fireworks, I let my buddies, I let them go light the fuse. I just stand behind and, and watch them now. That's that's like where I'm, where I'm at, I think. Now that I'm 31, I'm super mature, you know. Yeah, you really <laughs> Not at all. But, um, yeah, you get, you're, so you're, you're a New York guy, right? Yeah, New York so City. Where, were you born in New York City? Yeah, I was born in Manhattan at uh, Beth Israel Hospital. Wow. So yeah. you've been a, a Giants fan your whole life? There you go. 2-1-2. Two, one, two. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Yeah, well, you know, like, um, it's weird because I'm actually a Giants and a Jets fan. And, 
the reason for that is just because when I was a kid growing up, it was like pre direct TV, you know, before you could watch every game that you wanted to. And like, so we would get the local games and you'd have the Giants and the Jets. And like, we all love football. So it wasn't like we were just going to watch the Giants game and then turn off the Jets game. And the Jets sucked. So like, we just have it on in the background and like, it was they were like the like the junior varsity team, you know, like the little the little brother of the of the big brother, and you know, and all of a sudden one year when Parcells showed up, like all of a sudden they were good, and we were like, whoa, the Jets are good, but we had we had been rooting for them our whole lives, uh, like as a joke, and so anyway, so I so I like both teams, yeah. I got you. Is um well, Nick Mangle, Jets longtime center, is my college roommate. I grew up with Nick, so I've known him forever. Um, he's a he's one of the most beloved Jets guys for sure. He's been there forever, and big old burly. Mountain man, just a nice guy, good dude, great player. So you got him yeah. going for you. Um, you're so you we we're talking about weird stuff happening in L.A. and obviously Ohio and all over the world. What's so from when you guys kind of burst on the scene and got into this whole acting world? What's like? Have you seen weird things or what? Would, can you give any examples of like surreal moments you've had? Whether it might be with celebrities or like at some one of those weird parties you hear about, like in the hills in Hollywood that you could you could actually mention even if you don't have to mention anybody's name well i mean yeah you know but... like people was bringing out lions to a party or you know like all of a sudden there's a a puma walking around on a on a leash at a party or something stupid like that or maybe you guys hosted a few of those parties i was at uh the first big hollywood party i went to i won't say who it was that that was throwing it, but it was uh, it was a Halloween party, and they were dressed as uh, as Captain Ecstasy, and literally, the dude had like a dispense a dispenser with just tabs of of E that he was just giving to everybody, and he had you know like fruit juice. And like starburst things that like you know that were were delicious if you're you know if you're Xing and like uh, there were a lot of celebrities there and um, and uh, things were pretty crazy. Um, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound so you know I've had some pretty funny things. I, I had a, I had a woman who came up to me and, and propositioned me, um, but she wanted me to uh, make love to her as my character Finkelstein from Beer Fest, which is, uh, you know, in that movie, I play like a, like a nerdy Jewish scientist and you know, my voice is up here. I talk like this and, but she wanted, that's what she wanted. And, uh, and it wasn't like she was a, a desperate woman either. She was actually like quite attractive. And I think it was, I think she was having, she was having a nerd fantasy and she wanted it fulfilled. She also was German. And so I think there was a, Jer a, a Jewish thing there. I, I honestly don't know what it was, but it was like probably the strangest thing that's happened to me. Did it did it cross your mind? Did you have to think about it for a while? No, not really. I mean, I, <laughs> and uh, well, she, the thing is, if you break character, a girl like that will probably kill you. Oh yeah, no, I, I stayed in character. <laughs> <laughs> well, was her husband in the room with a tripod, running the tripod? He wasn't there. Oh, that's good to know. That is like a movie. That's like that's a script where you, you could write that into one of your scripts. That's almost like the weird. It's almost like you guys, your whole, you guys made famous the whole mustache ride situation. Did you guys coin that term or was that out before Super Troopers? No, it was out before Super Troopers. And it's, and it's funny that you asked this because uh, Kevin Heffernan and I have a podcast together. Yeah. Called Chewing It. And next week's episode is going to be about the movies that made us cry. Mm -hmm. And what we talk about in that is how having kids has made us much more sensitive. Wow. So that's an, uh, another thing. But in that same episode, we talk about the movie Mask because Mask is, you know, is kind of a tearjerker. Have you seen Mask? Not the Mask with Jim Carrey, right? It's not the Mask, just Mask. No, what is that? It's a true story. It's about this kid named Rocky Dennis. Oh, God, yeah, I know that one. You know why? Because <laughs> when, when I have long hair, people say I look like that dude. No. And I was like, trust me, I'm not offended. I was like, I look, I'm like, I kind of I can see where every couple every couple pictures of me where you guys could put it something together. So I'm not. I was like I'm not a. People would say that to me like trying to or every once in a while on as like a joke or trying to like get me upset. And I was like, I kind of understand it, man. I kind of see the similarity every once in a while in that. I get it. Yeah. So yeah. I can't have the same. 
I don't really have the same crying tendency to that movie, but yeah, I uh, I can see what you're saying. So that's what you guys are going through, the movies that made you cry? Well, that, well, this is that's next week's, next Wednesday's episode, but in that movie, uh, you know the actor Sam Elliott? Oh, yeah, one of the one of my favorite actors of all time, mustache. I mean, greatest mustache probably ever. There you go. So like, he is um, he's he was young in that movie. That was the first time I ever saw him, and it's like I was like, dude, that dude's badass. And there's one scene where he's he, you know he's got that mustache and he's wearing a T-shirt that says "Mustache Rides Five Cents." Wow. That's, uh, is that where you guys got it from? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How did that not catch on before before you guys then? Because they didn't like, uh, they didn't make a thing out of it. Like it was just, he never said anything. It was just the shirt he was wearing. And, uh, it's funny because like, I, I actually wound up working with him. I, uh, in like 1999, um, I, I was an extra in like a live television movie that, uh, that was filming for CBS. So like it was six weeks of rehearsal and then they actually shot it live, uh, on TV and broadcast it live. So it was, ba- it was basically like a play that rehearsed for, for six weeks. But so like I was at a table with him for six weeks and uh, like him and uh, Brian Dennehy and, uh, and James Cromwell, uh, this other great actor. And like it was me and the three of those guys and all three of those guys spoke. And I said, I didn't say anything. I just sat there. The whole time or just in the show? Uh, just in the show. Oh, I got you. Between rehe- like in rehearsals, like. I really didn't say too much either. Like they talked, but like, but Sam Elliott was, was cool. And, uh, he talked about how he talked about that shirt and how, you know, he knows he's got an awesome mustache (laughs) because like, you know, I'm looking at you right now and I'd say like from your lip to your nose is maybe like an inch. Yeah. I can't grow a mustache either. So I'm like a little girl too. (laughs) Okay. So, so I've got an inch as well, you know, He's got about his from his lip to his nose for whatever reason is about two and a half inches, <laughs> and so you realize he's just got great real estate for growing a mustache. So when he grows a mustache, it just comes in like gigantic. Yeah. So he was talking about that T-shirt, how he just that was his favorite T-shirt in real life, and uh, you know, wow. so he wore so it. so he lived. Did he uh, did he live up to the hype? Because I know a lot of guys don't, you know, don't ever meet your heroes. People say and they don't they don't live up to it there was he uh was he a true is he like how i picture sam elliott was his character in roadhouse yeah that's what i hope he that's who i hope sam elliott is in real life he is he lived up to it he's uh he's one of the heroes uh i've met a lot of the heroes who have let me down quite a bit and uh, this was a case where he was a guy who exceeded what i wanted you know like in some ways i must i, I had a man crush on him and, uh, you know, we were working together and, uh, we actually offered him a role in super troopers that he passed on, but, uh, at the rap party. So here's, here's, here's what Sam Elliott was doing. So his character, while we would, while we would rehearse, he was dipping the whole time <laughs> and, uh, which was fine, except that he didn't spit it out. He just swallowed his, God, his he's a man. He's a true man. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, then his character was supposed to smoke a cigar. So with about like a week to go during rehearsals, he started doing the cigar, you know, just to practice it and his t- the timing on the cigar. So now he was dipping and swallowing the, the spit and smoking the cigar, but like six cigars a day because he would rehearse all day. And I was like, dude's a fucking man. Look at that. <laughs> Unbelievable. So then, you know, we shoot the thing. And then we have the rap party. It's right there. It's at Warner Brothers. It's on the, on the studio lot. And it's like a, a massive uh, party because in the movie was like George Clooney and uh, Noah Wiley and, uh, and um, Don Cheadle and you know, Sam Elliott and Richard Dreyfuss. Like a bunch of guys were in, were in this movie. And, uh, and Brian Dennehy. And, and uh, so now he's, he's at the rap party and he's still dipping. And swallowing the dip, he's still smoking a cigar, and now he's drinking scotch. <laughs> and he's just, and I'm like, and he's wearing, and he uh, was wearing a red Hawaiian shirt. So like, which I'll never forget. I was like, and, and I went up to him because I could. I'd been working with him for six weeks, and I was like, dude, I just have to tell you, you're awesome. And he's like, you're awesome. <laughs> 
And I was like, no, man, you're like the coolest dude ever. He's like, you're the coolest dude ever. You were there every goddamn day. Oh, man. And I was, oh, and by the way, we're hugging. We're hugging right now. Because <laughs> we're a little fucked up. And, uh, and uh, I was like, how does it feel to be the, the, the toughest motherfucker on the planet? And he looks him in the eyes. He goes, you tell me. <laughs> And like that was that was our conversation. I was like, this dude is so fucking awesome. Now here's here's another thing about him. So he he brought his wife, and his wife is a woman named Catherine Ross, who uh, she was in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Mm-hmm. She's she's Paul Newman's girlfriend in, in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and she was also in The Graduate with uh, Dustin Hoffman. Like she plays she's the girl and. Um, so she was like one of the most beautiful actresses. And so she's the lead actress in Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. She's playing Paul Newman's girlfriend. And in the movie, Robert Redford, there's like, it's kind of like a love triangle. You know, like Robert Redford's always jokingly like trying to get her away. So she's acting with Redford and Newman in their prime in one of the best movies they've ever made. <clears throat> and Sam Elliott was an extra on that movie. That was one of his first movies. And he got the girl. He got the leading lady. Yeah. And he probably didn't even, I bet he didn't even try. He just was Sam Elliott. Yeah. And she could probably feel his presence just over. She's like, why is this dude like something about this guy back here? And he just probably staring at a little lady. He probably just looking at her, tipped his hat to her or something. Oh, yeah. Like, did his like, <laughs> that's yeah. awesome, man. That's, that's great. It's like he's always in character. It's like he oh, never. Yeah. Now, if a guy like that, man, that's, that's so good to hear. That's so inspirational to hear. But I, that's another thing, though. Like, my very first podcast I ever had, a while, a long while ago, was Brett Michaels from you know, lead singer Poison. Everything's still, still torn with the Brett Michaels band. And I was telling him like, people aren't. We were talking about like his old like Pittsburgh roots and his grandpa and all this stuff. And I was saying like, guys like that, once their generation dies, it sucks because there will never be another group of people like that. I feel like that Clint Eastwood. Um, that whole crew, and I feel like they don't make man men like they do, like they used to, man. Those guys, I don't feel like will ever, will never be graced by people that tough again, ever. It's uh, it's an interesting thing because, uh, you know, I was t- we were talking, Kevin and I were talking, we were talking about tearjerker movies, and we were talking about Brian's song. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. So that's like you know, young James Caan and young Billy D. Williams. I mean, the 60s and 70s, you're looking at guys like, yeah, you got Clint Eastwood, you got Steve McQueen, yeah. uh, you know, Charles Bronson, I mean, James Coburn, like all those dudes, Newman and Redford, Sam Elliott. I mean, you know, there's, there's guys now that I think, you know, it's like, like Harrison Ford is a guy, and I think Clooney is a guy. Um, True. How, uh, how about Brad Pitt? Is, is he involved in those guys? He seems like when he gets away from – his 15 kids he seems like a regular dude you know i think uh i think brad pitt is one of the most underrated great actors of our generation and the cool thing is is he's 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 going gracefully you know i think he's over 50 now which is crazy to me like he's probably 50 or 51 and like he's finding the right roles and i think he's going to become one of those i think he's going to wind up ultimately being like a paul newman guy um, cause I, you know, it's like, and same with Tom Cruise, man, you know, like when you see a Tom Cruise movie, it's going to be good. Even if it's not a classic, like even if it's not like a, a, a born the 4th of July Oscar winner, like you're going to get what you paid for. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just, like Brad Pitt, man, that dude has done a ton of roles and he's he, awesome in all of them. He really is. He's great, man. He's like great. snatch. I mean, you've seen snatch, I assume, right? fantastic you gotta be kidding me like how do you even speak like that how does he even whatever the accent he was using in his i mean that and then recently he was in uh fury the tank movie i don't know if you saw that i thought that was really good i didn't see that one i wanted to see that one uh you know i think the last one i saw was inglorious bastards yeah which was tremendous i mean that movie's tremendous and he's tremendous in it um and you know what? Honestly, like, uh, and not to be like a, a, a Hollywood jerk, but I, I hung out with him uh, one time. That was going to be my next question anyway. So, yeah. Have you ever got to hang out with a guy like Brad Pitt? There you go. I hung out with him. And uh, 
Hello. <laughs> all right hey man uh you got it yeah hey if you i tell you what we could do because so it won't cut out like a lot of times if we just turn our video well you can't, can't see me now can you if we yeah. turn the video off the audio the connection usually gets way better if you have any issues so if you just click let's just turn our video off and we'll just do the last little bit on audio and it'll be fine i've had to do that before okay well we can let's you know let's yeah we, just try it out yeah we'll see if it cuts out again then we can check it out all right um Brad Pitt, yes. continue, please. So it was, it was this thing like uh, I didn't know I was going to have dinner with him, and uh, it was this girl who was she was one of the producers of Super Troopers. So we hadn't even made that movie yet, and uh, she was like, you know, come meet me at the House of Blues, and uh, it was me and one of the other guys from uh, from from our group, and our uh, so we you know we gave our name at the door, and like the manager's like, oh yeah, come on back, and so you know we went into the main room, and he was like, all right come back here, like we went to a smaller section of the, like a more private area of the club. And he's like, yeah, keep coming. <laughs> and then we went into a really VIP room. And then there was a door at the end, he's like, all right, keep coming. And then we went out, we went through this door and it was a private balcony. And it was, you know, Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston, and our producer, and then, uh, and then me and, and my buddy. And we were like, whoa, this is, okay, that's, that's Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. And then nobody told us we were going to meet them. And, you know, we, we went up, sat down. And, you know, the irony is that, like, the head chef is just bringing out free food. Like, you know, here's filet mignon and, you know, here's, like all this different stuff. And so, you know, like at, at one point, like, Jennifer Aniston was like, oh, my, this filet is delicious. Do you want a bite? I was like, sure. And, like, she gives me her fork and, like, puts it in my mouth. I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, but, uh, and then, you know, like we did some shots of tequila. It was like one of those nights and it's, you know, like he was talking about his dad from Missouri. Like I was from Missouri and he was just like super down earth. He's already a major movie star at this point. Couldn't have been a nicer guy. And, you know, just like, it was just a really like, like I said, it's like we hadn't made super troopers, which shouldn't mean anything in the real world. But in Hollywood, it's like, you know, for a movie star to just be nice to a, a person who is anonymous um sometimes it's kind of out of the ordinary it's pretty was, rare out there isn't it yeah i think so if and you so, can't do anything is that the whole thing like if you can't do something for me is it hard for people to really even like give you respect or treat you you know the way a human should treat another human i think it varies from actor to actor you know and you can tell a lot about the person by their by the way they are like there are a lot of people who are like if you can't do something for me then you know a few and that's, a, that's too bad. There are a lot of people who, what they don't want is for people to feel awkward around them or, you know, like get uncomfortable or even just like kiss their ass a little bit. They, they want to just be a regular person and like, you know, and so they will go out of their way to make you more comfortable. Um, I think at the end of the day, ultimately, it's like what, what any of those people want is to, is to, or at least the healthy minded ones, just, they don't want to think, they don't want to like think about the fact that they are a movie star or anything like that. They just want to like be like they were because you know, it firsthand, it's like the second you start getting some notoriety, you can tell, you know, the way people reacted to you when you were younger and you were just a dude. And then like. You can you can tell the way people are different, you know. Like people will laugh at everything you say, or you know, like, uh, or come up to you and then argue in front of you about who, which one of them is the bigger fan, and you, you're not even saying anything. That they're like, I'm a huge fan. They're like, well, I'm a really big fan, and, and you're like, I'm such a bigger fan than you. And they're like, you're not a fucking bigger fan, you know. You're like, dudes, calm down, you know. Uh, so like. You know that it's uh, that that was a situation with, with Brad Pitt, where it's just like you know you could tell he was a cool guy, and like you know I I wasn't choking or like being a, a dumbass in front of him, and so it was like you know totally totally chill. And there are a lot of guys, there are a lot of good guys like that. Oh, I I believe it, man. I, I, I I'm sure there's plenty of good ones. We just don't hear those stories about like oh yeah, like what you just said. We went to dinner and it was really cool and fun. Like that's not going to make any headlines, obviously, but it's cool to know that. It's good to see when good people actually are successful. I think it's it's awesome because those 
I say eventually everything evens out, you know, and the guys that aren't aren't doing the work and aren't, no matter what your profession, the guys that are bad dudes will eventually fall to the wayside and people that are putting in the work and consistent and want to uh, treat people the way you should will eventually it'll pay off. You know, sometimes it's hard to see in the short term. I know for athletes, actors, anyone, it's a, it's a weird world, but I, I like, uh, what do you think happened with him and Jennifer Aniston, man? Could you tell any a rift at that, at that dinner at all? No, they seem perfectly close. And, you know, it was like, uh, she's gorgeous and cool and smart and funny. So, she might have had eyes for you. He probably saw the – he. I bet right when he got in the car, he's like, hey, for real, real you're going to feed this dude filet from your yeah. fork? Yeah. How dare you, Jen? Maybe that was it. That was probably the trigger that probably – that's what they always came back to. You know when, when couples fight, they always bring back something from like 15 years ago. Well, you you banged my high school boyfriend, you know, like a girl or yeah. guy will say. Whatever, yeah. girl, guy, whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's probably what it was. Remember you were the super troopers dude in the fork? And then play, that yeah. was probably it, man. That's what it was. That's what it was. Uh, yeah, and her, you know, her hand on my on my junk under the table. <laughs> it's, like, it's like that scene in. Uh, I was just talking about my father-in-law. We love that scene in um, Vince Vaughn and Luke Wilson or Owen Wilson. Uh, oh, Redding Crashers. Yeah, you know the scene when she puts his foot on him and. <laughs> that that scene is epic. That, that was your dinner. That was your dinner scene with Brad and Angela or Brad and Jen, wasn't it? Yeah, that's what that's what it was. I broke him up. Well, good for you, buddy. You're a powerful man. And that was before Super Troopers came out. Listen, man. It's just power. a testament to your handsomeness, then I guess. I'm like Sam Elliott, you know. <laughs> we get the girl. You're that's you guys should like put up on your Indiegogo. If we get to ten million, Sam Elliott has decided that he will join the cast. Dude, isn't that, that with Brian Cox? Five million? Is he coming on? Yeah, he's coming on. He's coming on. Easy. He's uh, he's. We've talked to him, and actually, the, you know, it's kind of lucky that the reason we're shooting, we start shooting September 28th, is because that's the only window of time he's got this year is October. So, in some ways, he actually locked down the the schedule for us inadvertently. So, which is good because then you just wind up postponing it. You know. Yeah. How long? How long is the shoot scheduled to be? I think it's going to be like uh, five or six weeks. So will you like? Will you have to go to set every day? Yeah, most likely. I mean, I'm in. You know, I'm in. You know, at least like eighty-five percent of the scenes. Um, and you know, even scenes that I'm not in, the chances are I'm probably shooting a scene later on in the day. Um, but you know, like because we we're not just actors in our movies because we're also writing them and producing them. So like the truth is I'll go to the set every day. Uh, you know, ideally it's like if other guys are shooting a scene, you want to show up there and like give them some suggestions for lines. I mean, you know, like you can always, you're always coming up with things right till, you know, right till the last second. And so, yeah. And the the set's a fun place to be. Where are you you guys shooting this one? I think we're going to shoot outside of Boston. Yeah. Just because, or do you guys? Because I know a lot of it, it goes with money. You, like cities will give tax breaks for shooting and all that. Yeah, that's it. It's uh, right now Massachusetts uh, seems to be offering the best uh, incentive for us. Really? Okay. So, what, are any movies gonna like? Why can movies not be shot? Or like, so many things are shot in like, Canada and all over where you get tax incentives. Can LA is is LA a dying dying ground for uh, for movie sets and TV shows? No, I mean you know LA. LA has the studios and yeah. the studios have the money. And so a lot of stuff is, I mean, the business is just there. And so like, you know, the truth is the farther away you get from Los Angeles, the harder it is to attract uh, good actors. So, you know, obviously not in New York city and there are places now that are growing, you know, Albuquerque is a place where, you know, there, there's a studio there now and uh, you know, they offer a 25% rebate in that, in that, uh, state. That's where we shot Beer Fest. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, whenever we travel away from Los Angeles, you just have a harder time getting people to show up for like a small role, you know, like uh, for the day. They can't just drive to the set. They have to fly and it becomes a hassle. Um, so like Cali- California doesn't really have to offer an incentive. Uh, Los Angeles, because that's where the business is and where the money is. And like the truth is like if the studio's like when you make a studio movie, 
they're just putting, they're actually putting the money right back into their own thing. Like they will, like we used to have an office on the Warner Brothers lot. We had a production deal at Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers, you know, they give, they give you a certain amount of money and then part of that is for rent. So like you wind up paying them uh, rent money to be on the back from their money they're paying you. Yeah, and you're on and you're on the lot, so it's like you know they a, a lot of the money goes like goes right back into the into the wheel, and so um, they're not you know they so they're fine. California's fine. It's the other places like like uh, I mean it's a good thing like like New Mexico. You know we went down down there. The budget for beer fest was I think fourteen million bucks, and you know that like you have to hire a certain amount of people. And so, you know, people are getting jobs and then you're putting money right into the economy. And so, uh, you know, and then gradually it's like all of a sudden all these things start from like Breaking Bad uh, film there. There's ton, tons of things shooting in Albuquerque now because of that rebate. That rebate and and uh, so they're making money. Yeah, I was reading uh, just recently about House of Cards shot their first three seasons. I forget where, but they're moving to somewhere like around Virginia, D.C. area now, I think, or Boston. I don't know. I don't know if you know or not, but they, because they were talking about how much, maybe it was Baltimore where they shot the first three seasons, but they were saying because they got, and they, they like broke down the numbers. Like they okay. got a $4.2 million tax incentive because they, they brought, they hired a hundred locals and all this stuff and whatever. So I'm sure there's crazy number games, but yeah, it's got a lot harder to get Tom Cruise to show up for a, a bit part in a, if you're in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I'm guessing. Yeah, that's what it is. Like, uh, you can. If you're in Los Angeles, you can just say to your buddy, like, hey, can you come do half a day on the, on the thing? And they're like, yeah, sure. And they'll come. Whereas, you know, if you're in, like, uh, someplace else, uh, they're not going to do it. you got to have John Travolta fly you on his jet. That's what you got to do. I don't think I want to go on Travolta's jet. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that, Steve? I've heard weird stories. <laughs> he's, been a, he's been a great pilot for many years now, Steve. So we'll just let that one go. Uh, <laughs> he was recently in Ohio shooting a movie. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I didn't see him, but people were talking about it. Him being around, uh, it was a, there was a buzz around town of how excited they were that he was here shooting. So yeah. I don't know, I don't know what the movie is, but I'm gonna start to wrap it up and let you roll, man. Um, I I really appreciate you coming on. I um I look forward to you guys shooting Super Troopers too. And when that comes out, I'm sure it's gonna be a big big deal. It already is. There's a lot of hype following your guys' whole process, but where can everybody uh, find you at, man, if they're looking for your stuff and to figure out if you and you and Farva are going to go back on the road and do some stand-up and everything? Yeah, all right, well, I'm on Twitter, at Steve Lemmy. L-E-M-M-E. Yeah, and then, uh, let's see, there's uh, heffernandlemmy.com, which is uh, for our comedy shows, but, but I don't think we're doing anything until uh, this fall, San Diego, uh, in December, but... Uh, we might add some dates on. Um, there's brokenlizard.com. That's, uh, you know, we're going to keep everybody posted about Super Troopers. Um, so I think those are the places. Uh, you know, my Instagram account is where, you know, like stuff goes to die. Like I haven't even, I don't even, social media and me, we're, we're still trying to work out an understanding here. Yeah, it's not a, it's, it's weird, man. It's like, uh, yeah, I'm with you. I don't know. I mean, you're an actor and a comedy guy, so. You can do anything and whatever people think it's, it's you like have a more creative mind to be funny, but I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I don't have Instagram really because I don't even know I'm terrible about posting stuff on Twitter even. So it's a, it's a weird, a weird deal that I, I don't know if I'll ever get used to, but, um, what's your Twitter handle? Official AJ Hawk. I, I got in real late, I guess. Um, so I don't know who AJ Hawk is, who are the, who are the, who the, that person is who has that, but so I had to go official and okay. there you go. I don't, I'm terrible. So any, I tell people all the time, I post the links to this, my podcast and every once in a while I try to come up with something decent, but it's never good. So, yeah. you know, sarcasm and like dry humor or anything that I have that would be decent doesn't, doesn't play on Twitter. No, it doesn't play. You have to throw like an emoticon up there, like a little winky, which, you know, I'm trying to get into those too now, but no, I cannot get into. Them. Do you send those to your wife? No. Okay. Does she send them to you? Yeah, she communicates in those emojis. Really? Yeah. So it's like if she if she's gonna say she's driving home, 
it'll be a picture of a car, it'll, a picture of a house, and then like a kiss. And I'm like, you know, it took her more time to search for those emojis than it would just say like driving home. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, have, I don't know if I've ever used one, but I've had buddies or people that will send them and try to like string all those together and try to get me to figure out what they're saying or what it stands for. Yeah. And I never figure it out. I never give it the time. And then I just don't respond to those people. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, like, you know, like with my wife, she'll send, yeah. There are girls are big on like exclamation marks. Um, like she'll every once in a while, I'll be like, hey, we te text my brother and tell him that I'll be there in a half hour or whatever. And she'll send him some text. And I'm like, you have like four exclamation marks in this little comment to my brother. He's, he knows this isn't me, obviously. I've never sent him something like that. Yeah. Well, now, like in like business emails, too. If you want to like, now I find exclamation points. It's like if you're, ha you know, if you want to show like that you really mean this, you have to throw it like, "Hey, nice meeting you the other day" with an exclamation point. You know, which I like. I, you know, I don't want to throw so much enthusiasm around. Like I like to play it cool, you know, and like like, like, like your dinner with Brad. Yeah, it'd be like, "Hey, had a great time hanging out with you the other day." Period. Point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's like I want to do a period. You know, like, "Hey, Jen's." Jen's meat tasted good. <laughs> I'd have to I'd, for, for that one. I'd have to throw a little, uh, the little winky, like the input. winky, the the wink, and an exclamation mark because everyone would understand. They would, they would feel you on that, man. That's <laughs> yeah. If there was like an emoticon that was like a pelvic thrust, you know, like <laughs> I'd get that one. Maybe they'll come up with that. Now you know they, what? If they see this, they have like I just saw something yesterday. They have moving emoticons. Oh God. That like uh, like do like booty quakes and things like that. <laughs> Twerking. They you twerk. Get, they twerk. They twerk. I want I want there to be like I want there to be like a public trust one. I think there should be like one of these. Yeah, you well, know, naturally. Yeah, I think there should be. You know, you gotta have one of these. Yeah, of course. Uh, those are the only three that I that I want. That you get is that what you'd use if if your wife texted you? <laughs> yeah, I just send back. I send back. <laughs> just the big middle finger. Yeah. You could do. You could just take a selfie of yourself doing that right now. I guess you'll have to. That'll suffice. Well, and then I saw another one where you could take your picture and put it into the emoji. What is technology is amazing, isn't it? We stole that from the aliens. We did. We That's must have. Right there. When the spaceship in uh, in Independence Day landed, and Will Smith punched the alien in the face, mm -hmm. we stole all their technology, reversed it. Yeah, they invented the emoji. Reverse engineering. That's what it was. Yeah. You, okay. Well. I'm be something rambling with you, but I, uh, <laughs> I, um, dude, technology, again? look at you. You got a green screen behind you in green your screen. basement. You got a swing arm. You see this swing arm? That's professional. Hey, buddy. Amazon. Amazon is my favorite place ever. It's the best. That's where I get everything. So yep. they're unofficial sponsor of this. Um, but Steve, really appreciate you, man. I, um, maybe when you're, uh, after you guys get done filming Super Troopers or even when it's ready to come out, we will, uh, I'll try to get you back on here. I'm sure you'll be walking red carpets and going to premieres all over the place and fulfilling your Indiegogo uh, promises, actually. Got a lot of that to do. If I renew my vows, I'll be married 10 years, and probably when, when your new movie comes out, it'll probably be about my 10-year uh, anniversary. Maybe maybe I can talk my wife into having you guys be our best best man. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, let me think about it. Let me start. Let me start an Indiegogo for myself to have you guys come on to my wedding. My renewal of my vows. That's that's what somebody did. One of the guys who asked us if we could do his wedding. We were like, yeah, we're we're available that date. Then we saw he'd started an Indiegogo to raise the money. Well, that's. I mean, I, yeah, I don't. If money's money, I guess if he's gonna give it to you guys, that's cool. Yeah. You're well. You're probably the who's gonna be in your ballpark is gonna be the super rich dude that was married before he was rich and he dumps her to uh to upgrade to some like 23 year old bimbo yeah that's who you're gonna he's gonna have that's the wedding you'll be at yeah yeah that's fine yeah either way it's fine that would be then 23 year old bridesmaids and um <laughs> well i mean i'm married and um so not me but maybe for somebody else yeah someone else in, in your crew will be sending emoticons or emojis back to uh back and forth with those girls yeah, exactly. Well, wow. all right, man. Thanks, thanks a lot. I um, we'll put your stuff up. We'll link all your your Twitter, and everything. Steve Lemmy, L E M M E. But um, thanks again, and we will uh, hopefully talk again soon. Yeah, dude. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Man. All right. All right.
We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at officialAJHawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on the Hawkcast. Cast.